he looked up at me with tears in his eyes and he said, Major, he said, they're either all dead at Ben Trey, and the ones that ain't dead are here getting worked on today. We landed, we had a few days off, and we received orders that we were going down to uh, Bentray. Bentray was the provincial capital of Kenwa province. Kenwa was about oh, 55, 60 miles from south, south of uh, Saigon in the heart of the Delta. You came into uh, the city of Mito, and you had to catch a ferry across the Miko, Mekong River. Ferry was a oh, 15, 20 minute ride, because Mekong's a very large river. And once you hit the bank of the area, you had about another 15, 16 miles to get to Ben Trey. The base at Ben Trey was an army base, and there were no real ground troops working in Kenwa province when we got there. It was a hotbed of enemy activity during the Tet Offensive of uh, 1968. The battle had been trade during Tet was so bad, the Army Major called in B-52 B bombing strikes on the city of Bentray. The final report that he wrote up was, we had to destroy the city to save the people. So if you're going to fight a war, Bentray was a good place to be. We had a great boat crew. We never met them until we arrived in Bentray. Three quarters of these guys had no clue as to what Navy SEALs were and what Navy SEALs did. They were just attached to this group back then. It was called Bo Boat Support Unit 1. All of them were some good guys. Cronk, Hunt, Buddha, McLaren, Pendergrass, Appleby, and the list goes on. They, uh, it was a group of guys that were trained to, in different fields, we had one of them that was electronic, one of them that was an uh, engine repair man. So it was their sole responsibility to keep the boats running, keep them in complete operational readiness at all times. We uh, became brothers with these guys also. Throughout the years since Vietnam, I have remained very close to a number of these guys. We'll continue to do so till I'm gone. That's how much respect we had for him. Buddha ended up being one of my closest friends. He's been gone oh, about two years now. We got in a real bad firefight one night. Buddha knew that it was bad. They were a little ways up on the river after we inserted. They knew how much ammunition we carried. They knew how long we could sustain a firefight. As we finally were able to start moving back to our boat, we ran into Buddha in the jungle. He had picked up an M16 ammunition and he was coming in to bring us ammunition. That's how much they respected us and how much we respected them. We didn't receive orders from anybody. Nobody in Vietnam sent us orders. Nobody at SEAL Team 1 in the United States sent us orders. We ran all of our own intel ourselves. We developed our own operations and operated on them. Frequently, I would go into uh, Saigon with uh, Lieutenant Collins, where we were going over different intel from the Army, the Marines. We would pick activity up that we knew was going on in our province and then we could develop our own plan of action of what we wanted to do. I have a large diary that uh, contains every op that we did during this period of time. It talks about each individual that would go on the operation. It talks about personal weapons, personal gear that each one of us would carry with us in the woods. It would give the insertion points, extraction points, it give the terrain, it would give the current weather conditions. It would give a brief history of what we were going to do and who we were going after. Most of the time when we went in the woods at night, we knew who we were going after. If we didn't 
know his name, which we did a lot of times. We knew at least that we were going to go after a doctor, a dentist, a propaganda agent, a tax collector, a low-level or a high-level Viet Cong individual. As I go back through this diary and look at it, I, I can think back now, you know, 50 years later. Damn, we were idiots. Seven of us would go in the woods after, say, a tax collector that we knew was going to have 25 to 35 guards with him. But that didn't bother us. We'd just load up and go in the woods and see if we couldn't get him. Tan Fu secret zone, well, it stretched all the way up to the South China Sea and quite a bit of the way inland. There was a lot of Viet Cong movement in the South China Sea, bringing in weapons, medical supplies, or whatever to the enemy troop. There was a lot of massive movement all over Kimwa province. When we would be operating in Tan Fu, we would hear them test firing 51 caliber Chinese made machine guns. They have a distinctive sound. If you put a 50 caliber American-made gun out there and a 51 caliber made Chinese weapon, you know which one was which when you heard it go off. So we did run a lot of ops down there where we were after certain people. One of the ops was known as a, a pigeon op. I don't remember if it was the Army or one of the other military branches that had captured a pigeon that had messages strapped to its leg at dealing with a movement that was going to happen in the Tan Fu. We got the intel, we ran the op, and nothing came of it. Whether it was false information or it was correct information, it just didn't pan out. When you stop and think about a North Vietnamese soldier, They've been fighting that war for years and years and years. They were well trained. You can ask any soldier, combat soldier, that ever came up against North Vietnamese troops, and he'll tell you how well trained they were. You did not want to back them up with just the South China Sea to their back and nowhere to go because they'd hand you a fight, and a fight you didn't want. small group of thatch hooches. We landed by helicopter, made a survey of the area, went in. There was still hot tea on, this, on the table. There was quite a large bunker. The hot tea indicated to us that, oh, these guys were just here. They're now in the bunker. There were either three or four entryways into this bunker, and it was quite large. So we stationed one or two guys around each entryway. We threw in uh, CS grenades, threw in concussion grenades, nothing happened. Bunker didn't even really move. Gordon Clisham and I are standing close to one of the entryways. I noticed this arm throwing an American hand grenade out of the bunker toward us, and my brain's looking at it going, wow, he just threw an American hand grenade at me. And about that time, I said, well, I need to run. And as I turned to my left to run, the hand grenade went off. I took part of it in my left leg. Garden was, oh, 10, 15 feet behind me. He had turned to run. He tripped. Uh, quite a large bit of the hand grenade uh, went up Garden's backside into the growing area. He was medevaced out, given a medical discharge from Uncle Sam. And when we have our reunions back east, they're normally held at Garden's home. Alan is one of the few of us that's still alive. Don't get to see him as much as I like to. Don't get to talk to him as much as I like to. Either November or December 70, we had uh, gone on an operation and stayed 14 or 15 hours or so. And we were coming up onto a factory that made homemade bombs and stuff in the jungle. We knew where we were going. We just took a long route to get there. The tributaries in Vietnam have a massive tidal flow change. That little creek can be 10 foot deep and 20 foot wide. When the tide's out, it's going down real fast and you might be in knee deep mud and only a foot of water. Well, that's what happened when we came up on 
the ammunition factory. We're coming out of the mud, trying to get up about an eight foot embankment. And we come up right in front of the ammunition factory. And they open up on us. So we're trying to re regroup to where we can figure out what's actually happening. Where's everybody out? Out of Vader is standing right off to my left, and he starts shaking his hand, hollering, I'm shot, I'm shot, I'm shot. I said, Alan, where you shot at? So he holds up his hand, and one of his fingers is shot completely off. I got photographs of it, him at the hospital. Called in, got a medevac, sent him to the hospital. A little bit later, I got on another vac, went up to the hospital to check on Alan. So I asked one of the people in the ward there where was the, the Navy SEAL that I had sent up there with a finger missing. They went, oh my God. They said, we gave him a bar surgical soap and a toothbrush and a serrated morphine. I went, oh crap. Well, I gave him a serrated sur morphine in the jungle, but I forgot to tag him with that serrated morphine. So, he didn't tell him at the hospital. They just immediately went ahead and gave him another serrated morphine. But when I walked in that bathroom, he's got his wounded hand leathered up, and he's got a surgical toothbrush just working on the nub of that finger. All I could do is bust out laughing. <laughs> and he was laughing. And then the, the nurses finally came in and took him away and got him all sewed up. And like I said, we're still good friends. We still talk. We still visit. One of the other ops where we lost our first two guys, and there are certain things you're trained to do or not to do. One of the things that you're trained not to do, you never go back and insert into an insertion point that you have previously inserted in. Frank had ran a an op on this small tributary off of the truck gang. And about two weeks later, he took 2nd Squad F, that's him, and six other guys. They inserted exactly the same spot that he had previously landed the boat in off onto the shore. And the first thing that you would do, you would hit the beach. Everybody got off that boat just as fast as they could. You would immediately set down for 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes, whatever it took, and you would listen. The boat would pull back down the river ways and then pull into a river bank and kind of hide itself in the dark. Now, like I said, this was Frank's seventh trip to Vietnam. He had been a PRU advisor on one of the trips right in Ben Trey itself. Frank was a big man. He was probably at this time the largest SEAL operating. Frank was probably, I'm going to say 6'4", six, 6'5". Six, Not really fat, but he was pushing 320 pounds. And we had all heard the legends of where he had walked into a Viet Cong ambush one night. They had never seen a man as big as Frank. They did not open up on him because they didn't think they could kill him. So after they had sat there that, that 10, 15 minutes, whatever it took, they stood up and proceeded into the jungle and all hell broke loose. The Viet Cong had come in and dug fighting holes and trenches a little ways inside the jungle. Jim Ritter was walking behind Ah. Ah was basically moved out upwards of maybe 10 yards. And then Ritter walking point for the American SEALs was behind him, Frank was behind Ritter. Rick Hetzel was the radioman for second squad, he was third in line. Right behind Rick was Happy Baker, and then another Vietnamese scout that was down working for us. Well, as they stood up and started moving into the jungle, like I said, all hell broke loose. Jim Ritter took three rounds in the heart that I could have covered up with a silver dollar. Frank took a rocket launch grenade right in the growing. Our Radio backpacks that we carried were running anywhere from 70 to 80 pounds. So when Rick or I sat down and had to get up, we would lean forward on all fours and then push ourselves up. As Rick was getting up, he took an AK round right in the shoulder. It came out below his shoulder blades. It knocked him into Happy Baker. Happy was carrying a sawed-off M60 machine gun. The force was so great that it knocked Happy back into the river and the other Vietnamese scout. 
the boat at that time had called in to us to let us know that second squad was in a bad firefight. Our boats were parked up to the river right there where our base was. So there was always a seal sitting on the dock with the radio guarding the boats. I just happened to be sitting on the dock that night with my radio when I heard the call come in. I notified the boss. So shortly, first squad, we got in one of our other boats headed down the river to the ambush site. SEAL Team 2 had a group of Navy SEALs working out of Mito, which wasn't but maybe 16 miles from us. Also, they came down with a whole 14 squad of SEALs from SEAL Team 2. And when we got down to the ambush site, as Rick got hit, knocked Happy into the junk, uh, into the river, and Rick was shot up pretty good. Happy had to get Rick out of his radio gear and swim him out into the truck gang river, which the truck gang's one of the very large tributaries off the Mekong. The boat came in and actually found them and pulled them ab aboard. We got down there. I wasn't anywhere around. Like I said, he was walking in front of Ritter. The scout wasn't anywhere around. There wasn't any activity going on on the beach. All of us opened fire away from the actual ambush site. Into the We waited till daylight to go in and retrieve the bodies. And that's when the realistic, what went on, Frank should have never pulled in to that riverbank the second time. We recovered Frank's body and Jim's body. We did not pick up all of these spent enemy cartridges. Nobody that in the second squad got fired a shot that night. So every cartridge that we picked up was an enemy cartridge, spent cartridge. We picked up 1,600 spent cartridges that we could find. And as we were prepping and just about to leave the area, everybody carried little pin lights. And one of our emergency little pin lights was a little red one that we used. And we noticed a little red dot going off and up on the bank. Probably 500 yards down from where the uh, initial ambush took place. We pulled in and it was uh, our Vietnamese uh, guide and scout. I had been shot in the right arm, tore his arm up real bad. So we took our own board. We went back to the base and immediately had a sit down and a go over what went on. Rick is already stripped of his clothing, put on a better back and shipped out to the hospital. But as we were taking his clothing off, the camouflage shirt that Rick had on, very rarely did I wear this one particular shirt due to the fact that it was built and made for a radio man. It had a, it was just a little bit too large. It had a life vest built into it to where if we were in the river with our radio on, it could support our weight plus the radio. There were 21 holes through Rick's upper camo jacket. Rick is shipped out to the hospital that's just getting a little head, but it's part of this story. About three weeks later, he's discharged out of the hospital in the Philippines. He doesn't touch base with anybody at SEAL Team's headquarters in Coronado. He just gets on an airplane, flies back to Ben <laughs> and walks in on us. It really upset my boss that Rick was still shot up and still recovering. He got sent back to the States. Now, Jim Ritter... Like I said, took three rounds to the heart. Probably two weeks prior to this happening, we were in the same general area where this ambush took place, maybe a mile or two from where it took place. We went to make a 90-degree right-hand turn that night. So as we were trolling in the jungle, the guy in front of me, his gun would be on fully automatic, but it's pointing to the right. My gun would be on fully automatic, pointing to the left. The guy to board me, behind me, would be on fully automatic with his weapon pointing to the right. So it crisscrossed all the way down. We were close enough to where I could whisper into the guy's ear behind me. The guy in front of me whispers, we're fixing to make a 90 degree right hand turn. I told the guys behind me, they passed it all the way back down. 
we're not moving at this time, we're standing still. We start to make a 90 degree right hand turn. Brown is walking secure, uh, rear security that night with an M60 machine gun. He's already been told we're fixing to make a right hand turn. He hears something off to the right and he opens up with an M60 machine gun and he shoots Jim Ritter in the left cheek of his butt. Jim goes to the hospital gets, and it luckily it went through nothing but the fleshy part of his buttocks. So about two and a half weeks to three weeks later he comes back and operates with us. This is his first time back in the jungle and he gets killed at night. The wives or the parents of us would know we were in Vietnam. They did not know exactly where we were in Vietnam. We were butts to each other on how we dealt personally with each other. The boss told me to have everybody standing on the grinders. He had gotten a letter from Jim Ritter's mother and he was going to read it to us. This was about a month after Jim's death. We we're standing at attention while the boss read the letter. Miss Ritter says that Jim was doing what he wanted to do. She did not know the circumstances upon the death of her son, but she knew he was serving his country, doing what he wanted to do, and that was all she could ask of her son. And at that point there, when the boss got through reading the letter, he said, I just want y'all to remember and start treating each other a little bit better and not as much harsh play. So that was kind of a wake-up call. We're down the end of the secret zone. This was a, another dumb daylight operation. There's seven guys in the woods. So noise is heard, not too far off a of small tributary. There are like five sandpans. A sandpan's like a Louisiana flat bottom Piro. There were about anywhere from seven to ten guys in each one of the sandpans. It's right about lunchtime. They pull into the riverbank not too far from the seal squad. Everybody at this point is hunkered down, hiding. Walk a little ways into the dense jungle. They stack their rifles up in like a little TP stand and they start cooking lunch. And then there's at least 30 of them. At this time, the SEAL squad is set up in an L-shaped ambush with these 30 guys pretty close to the middle of the ambush area. There are at least two M60 machine guns that shoot 800 rounds a minute. There's at least three stoner machine guns that shoot close to 800 rounds a minute. There is one M16 with a 203 grenade launcher attached to that M16. And they're sitting there unarmed with their guns stacked up eating lunch as we're getting ready to open up on them. And I goes, I'm not going to shoot. He said, there's 30 of them, they'll kill us. I'm not going to shoot. We could not chance around not using his M60 machine gun. So the whole SEAL squad sits there until they're through eating and gets in their boats and leave. Then the SEAL squad gets in its boat and goes back to base. And the next morning, Brown is on his way back to the States and kicked out of SEAL team. Take the place of the guys that are killed or the guys that are kicked out. Happy Baker comes into X-ray platoon as a replacement. Happy's a good guy. He just liked to drink and stay drunk too much, which caused a little problems with us, but he ended up finishing out the tour of duty with us. Paul Barnes is sent to Uncle Dave's platoon as a replacement for one of their guys down at Rock Jaw. We get another one of our guys killed just as Dave's platoon is shutting down and coming to stateside, and they end up sending Paul Barnes down to us as a replacement. Paul and I went through underwater demolition training together. We went to SEAL team together. So I'd known Paul since our beginning in, this, in, in the middle of 69. While he's down at Rock Job with Uncle Dave's platoon, they go out into the South China Sea one night. and The officer in charge was Lieutenant Marsh. Paul's the other guy, and there's four or five LDNNs, which are Vietnamese trained Navy SEALs. And they're checking papers. A large sand pan goes by them with no light on. They try to stop them. They, they held them to stop. The enemy guys in this large sand pan turns around and opens up on the two Navy SEALs and the four or five 
Vietnamese seals that are in the boat. Lieutenant Marsh is shot up real bad. All four or five of the Vietnamese seals in our boat are killed. Paul takes his stoner machine gun and just opens up on the sandpan as it's going by and blowing them away. And when it's all said and done, Paul lowers his stoner machine gun in, in the stern of the boat. The boat just sinks with him. And so Paul is left out there with Lieutenant Marsh shot up real bad. Paul swims for the next three, four, five hours with Lieutenant Marsh under tow. And for this operation, Paul is awarded a silver star for saving Lieutenant Marsh's life. So Paul is sent down to work with us. It was a great pleasure to see my teammates show up from training. And we had had a number of firefights. I'm, a, I'm basically just picking out points where we were hit hard enough to where we sustained damage. Uh, the boss and I had been working on some intel of a weapons cache in the jungle. We had picked up a Chuhoi Chuho Center that had this intel. We had probably been working on it a week. It was Sunday morning, the 28th of February, 1971. The boss told me to get ready that I would be running this operation. I was to pick who I wanted to take in the woods with me that day. Enlisted SEAL men are not allowed nowadays to run a mission. Most of us during the Vietnam era ran an operation with everybody under our command. It was just a practice that we all did because we were all virtually cross-trained in each other's jobs. Picked out six other individuals that I wanted to go in the woods with me that afternoon. We traveled by our light seal support craft known as the LSSC number 11. We uh, went by a third army Arvin outpost in the jungle and right before we got into a series of bad ass turns in the river we heard a gunshot a rifle shot in the uh, woods, like normally they would uh, do that to uh, let the, uh, uh, some more of the other enemies know that they had spotted somebody or American troop operating. We went in, we had a very easy weapons cache recovery. We took the weapons and the ammo, loaded them on our LSSC. We also loaded up somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 60 pounds of granulated sulfur. Placed it all in our boat and had an extraction headed back to base at Ben Trey. We're in the middle of the S curves prior to getting up to the third Arvin outpost. I'm sitting with my back, my feet are dangling inside the LSSC. I'm sitting on the ridge where the console is. Uh, my radio still on my back and I'm looking over my left shoulder to the riverbank. I noticed two Viet Cong in black pajamas stand up with B-41 armor piercing rockets on their shoulder. I'm in the process of bringing my car 15 up to a firing position as the first rocket hit our boat. It went in directly under, directly where I was sitting. I was sitting, I had a prisoner Sitting there, he was squatting Vietnamese style. My left foot is on his shoulder. The rocket hit the boat directly square in the middle of his back. It cut him in two. Jim McCarthy was standing to the uh, right of this uh, prisoner. It tore part of Jim's left buttocks off and quite a bit of meat off of his leg. Paul Barnes is standing a little bit behind me. It tore Paul Barnes' leg off, off to the right of Paul Barnes with Jim uh, McLaren with the boat crew. Jim lost the leg that day also as the fragments of that rocket exited out the other side of our boat. They fired both B-41 rockets at us. One took, we took a direct hit from one of them. We took a glancing hit from the other. As I was raising my weapon and turning toward the enemy, I could remember watching my car 15 fall into pieces as the initial shock of the explosion blew it apart. 
like I said, I had my uh, Brick 77 radio on my back. I had a pair of Levi's on that day and a camouflage top. The explosions blew my radio apart and tore my shirt off of my body. The only sustained injuries I had that day were both eardrums were blown out and I had 27 of fragments of my radio or fragments off of the boat enlarged into the, my skull. Most of them are still there. I was able to get the radio up and running, notified the boss what had happened. We're still taking fire from the riverbanks as the boss and second squad show up. The initial blast of the B-41 rocket threw me on the inside of the boat. My face is laying in the buttocks of Jim McCarthy. Uh, he wasn't moaning, he wasn't moving. I thought Jim was dead. I sat up, I watched Paul Barnes. His uh, left leg is gone at the kneecap. His right leg is severely tore up. Paul sat up, took his head bandana off, made a tourniquet around his left leg. He took the barrel out of an M16, tightened the tourniquet down, took his belt off, and he tied the barrel of that 16 to his left thigh, tying the barrel down, so securing the tourniquet that he'd put on his own leg. He took a pack of Marlboro cigarettes out of his shirt pocket, put one of them in his lips, went to light it, his eyes rolled in the back of his head and he passed out and fell over. I was able to notify a army helicopter that was in the air fairly close to us. It was carrying some uh, Vietnamese troops. I ordered him to land that I had severely wounded Americans on board. I ordered him to land to unload the Vietnamese, pick up my wounded and take them to the hospital, which he did. As I picked up Paul Barnes and put him inside the helicopter, Paul woke up for a brief few seconds. He looked me in the eye and he said, Major, do not let them cut my leg off. His leg's already gone. Like I said, this was the 28th of February, 1971. I made the second helicopter trip to the hospital. Me, Don Barnes, and Kronk, who was with the boat crew, we all went up because we had shrapnel wounds and blown out ears. We were held overnight for the next couple of nights. The third day, I was gonna catch a helicopter ride back down to Ben Trey. All of us Navy SEALs carry priority one orders on us. I could go into any airport, lay the orders on the table. They had to put me on the next available airship headed to where I wanted to go. We were able to wear civilian clothes, carry weapons and demolition with us uh, under these priority one orders. And I was told that there'd be one living within the next 30 to 40 minutes. I was told which one of them it was out there on the helo pads that I could go out there and get on board and wait on, wait on the pilots. As I'm sitting on the helicopter, I noticed one of the Navy SEAL corpsmen walking around looking at the different helicopters like he's searching for something. He finally got up to my helicopter. I noticed he's got a fifth of liquor with him. He sees me and he said, Mage, come on. He said, let's go get drunk. I said, I can't. I said, I'm going back to Ben Trey. He said, oh, you got time. He said, uh, let's go get drunk this morning. I told him I couldn't. I had to go back to work. He looked up at me with tears in his eyes and he said, Major, he said, they're either all dead at Ben Trey and the ones that ain't dead are here getting worked on today. The boss had wanted to do one more operation before our tour duty ended, so he loaded up the guys and went on an operation in Tanfu Secret Zone, very close down to the South China Sea. This is the next time when we know that we had been set up. The boat crew takes the, the big boat, the MSSC, they load up and they go down into the area where they want to hold an ambush. The Viet Cong knows they're coming. So the Viet Cong let them come through the first ambush site. They get a little farther up the river and the second ambush site opens up on them. 
a rocket launch grenade hits one of the canopy posts that holds the canopy on the medium seal support craft right above Lieutenant Collins's head. Lieutenant Collins is killed with some very bad head injuries. Mike Kaplanor, who took the radio in the woods that night, is standing directly behind the Lieutenant Collins. He took my place as a radio man, and Mike Kaplanor suffered some severe facial injuries. Luda Crows, who was with 2nd Platoon, he's an E-7 Petty Officer in his sixth trip of duty to Vietnam at this point. Lou suffers some severe head wounds to where he ends up with a large metal plate in the front of his skull. He's medically retired from the military. Stateside shuts down the X-ray platoon at this point. There's three of us left. We're to pack up our gear and ship it home, which is a job I didn't want to do. We've got the gear packed up and shipped home. We're sitting at the Tonsonut Air Base. They're outside of Saigon waiting on our ride to go home. I don't remember sitting there. I don't remember making that flight home. I had brought this topic up with my wife numerous times over the years. She told me, she said, why don't you just call one of the guys that came home and ask them what happened. So like I said, there were three of us of the original 14 that was able to make that flight home. I called David Shadnall. David lived in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan at the time. I asked David about our flight home and he told me what went on. He said when we land state, landed stateside in North Island, he said every active duty Navy SEAL on the West Coast greeted that airplane as the three of us came off of it. I have no recollection of that happening. Apparently it's true because I've talked to several of the guys over the years since then that said, yes, Clint, we all met y'all when you touch down in North Island. Chip Amon, one of the Navy SEALs who did 30-something years active duty before he retired, was one of my friends that I went through all of my training with. Chip was there to pick up our light boat on the 28th of February when Paul lost his leg. Tip was also one of these seals that went in three days later to pick up the big boat. And Tip used this in his teaching of younger seals over the next 30 years about leaving brothers wounded or dead in the jungle and how to get them out. On the 28th of February, on that where Tip came in to get my boat out that we left in the jungle. Tip said that there were several M16s laying in the bottom of the boat. The boat was covered in so much blood you could not even see a 16 rifle. You had to dig through the blood to get equipment. I was wearing my camouflage beret that afternoon. It was gone. Paul Barnes goes to a SEAL Team 2 reunion 30 years later in Little Creek, Virginia. He is given the beret because they think it's Paul's. Paul said, no, but I know who that beret belongs to. Paul called me, and he said, Clint, I just put something in the mail to you. I said, well, what is it? He said, when you get it, you call me. So when it showed up at my house and I got it open, I could not believe it. Paul did not wash it. It was sent to me with the blood still caked on it from 30 years prior. I knew exactly the minute I opened that box and looked down and saw that camouflage. I knew that that was my beret. So I washed it. It stayed hung on my wall for a long time under the photograph of Paul Barnes. The wife and I and my daughter are sitting in my living room. My three-year-old granddaughter is running through the house. My bed's right up against the wall where this beret's hanging on the wall. My granddaughter comes walking down the hall with my beret on her head and just goes, Papa, look! And I mean, that was just a touching moment to see her with that beret on her head. The beret now hangs in my 14-year-old's grand, grandson's bedroom on the wall, and that's where it'll stay. The fact that what I started with earlier where we were the most shot up Navy SEAL 
to work in Vietnam. We also had a Vietnamese trained Navy SEAL that worked with us by the name of Tong. Several of us noticed strange things that after months went by and stuff, we sat down and just started adding stuff up. We could go in the woods and the time was with us, we didn't have any really activity. On operations where we went in the woods and time didn't go with us, we, we got the crap shot out of us. When Lee Collins got killed, they shut us down about two weeks early, and there were only three of us at that time left in Vietnam, so they flew us home. It was a little bit strange flying over, over with 14 friends and making the same flight home with only three of you. When they shut our platoon down, the CIA went in and did some studying to figure out what had gone wrong. Conclusions they came up with, we had two major problems. The Milo officer, which that's a naval intelligent liaison officer, we had to file reports, handwritten reports of where we were going to operate, when we planned on being in there, if we were going to be there at 10 o'clock Monday morning, we might say that we're going to be there from Sunday at 5 a.m. till Wednesday at 10. So we had to give a time frame when we're going to be in this particular area. We had to give a little bit of description of why we were going to be in that area. It was turned over to not only the naval liaison officer, it was turned over to upper Vietnamese people. Any military base you walked on in Vietnam had X amount of Vietnamese who worked inside the base, whether they were the, a cook, a shoeshine boy, or a mama son that cleaned the hooch and washed your clothes. There were lots of them on each military base. The Nilo officer was openly posting areas that we were going to operate in under a certain time zone. So between him, the LDNN, who we halfway suspected a few months later, was also turning our information over to the enemy. A number of the LDNNs that operated with Navy SEALs live here in the States nowadays. A number of them are still back in Vietnam. A whole lot of them were executed when the North Vietnamese took over the country. Some of the guys that came and lived in the States are still allowed to go in and forth and visit family nowadays. About four or five years ago, I'm not sure exact, one of the LDNs that works here and lives here in the States went back to visit family, what we knew as Saigon, came back with photographs of Tong still alive, and he holds a high-level position in the city of Ho Chi Minh under the communist rule. So at that point there, we know, yes, he was giving out information on operations that we were conducting. The name of the book is Nam Mares. And what it is, like I told you, I've got a written diary of every operation we did on this particular tour of duty. It's not really a war book. There's very little of the combat in there. Very little structured combat in there. It's more or less how over a last 50 year period with leaving Vietnam and putting up with the nightmares, with the memories, with three wrecked marriages and the marriage number four to a lady that's been able to handle everything I dished out over the last 33 years. And that's basically what it is. None of the old SEALs have said anything bad about it. They've all told me they enjoyed it. They liked it. But they also told me to hurry up and write the war story that goes along with this period of Navy SEALs operating in Vietnam.